right, guys, these are two locks from Den Brass. Dennis lives up in Canada, and he works on these every winter and sends a pile of them to me and pretty routinely kicks my butt. Now, I gave up not on one. I gave up on both of these. There were two locks in this batch. Uh, this one comes with some instructions, and it said pick clockwise, open clockwise. So I tried that, and I got nothing, no, no luck at all, not even a fault set. So... I ignored the instructions and I tried to pick it counterclockwise. I got a fault set and messed with it, but I never got it open. So I put it back and tried it for another couple of nights. No luck whatsoever. Now, when I put the key in, the lock doesn't even work. So I clearly violated something that m motivated him to say, pick this only clockwise. So the key doesn't work. I think something jammed. So I, I set this one aside and just gave up. And that's been two weeks ago. So I started playing with this guy. Now let's go back just really quickly and take a look at this key. <laughs> I'm going to start making excuses for my pathetic lock picking skills here. Um, you guys routinely violate something called max code. We all do that in the lock, lock sport industry. We all try to screw each other by creating keys like this. Now max, M-A-C-S, and I'll put a link for it down in the description, stands for Maximum Adjacent Cut Specification. And what that tells us is the maximum number of cuts in, our, in terms of depth between adjacent pins. And normally it's around five. So if you have a very deep cut one, say it's a nine cut, you subtract five from that, the one next to it can't be any more than a four. And clearly this one is much more than that. In fact, that first pin, if you look closely there, it's even cut down into the body of, of the lock itself. So this is probably way, not only violating max code, it's just violating the code altogether by going a little too deeply. For a challenge lock, it's completely fair. It doesn't matter. But what this does is it forces us to take a pick and slide it down the keyway. And let's just take, let me grab a thin pick here. So when I slide it down the warding, and it would have to fit in there like that, as soon as I slide that pick down there, that first pin is automatically up, uh, overset by the, by the thickness of that pick. Now I may be able to pick him. Now I go down here, I'm going to violate him. He's going to be overset. That one will be overset. I may be able to pick those guys if I'm lucky, but look how many of the other previous pins I've overset. And that's why, as in the lock sport community, we violate max all the time. The other thing is we have a paracentric keyway. So if I am forced to work from the bottom of the keyway, which I routinely do, and I think we all do, lately I've been playing around with 13,000 so that I can get it into the keyway, get it around that curve, and sometimes, but not with this lock, curve it around there in such a way that I can get those very high cut uh, pins. This lock doesn't allow that. You can see that even with a 13,000, there's no way he's going to bend around that warding. Just no way at all. Just not going to happen. So I would just put it to you that given these very, very high cut pins hiding behind these low cut pins, at least with this lock, I wouldn't have been able to pick it anyway. Probably not going to happen. Then I picked up the second lock. And he's a, he's a schlag. We've seen him many, many times. And this one's in perfect shape. Um, sometimes when you look at the front, because they have this uh, angle to make it easy to get your key in, it's a little hard to tell just how steep that angle is. So let's turn them around and take a look at the rear. That should give you a good idea of what that angle is like. So again, I'm going to take my 13,000th. I'm going to slide them in from the front. And let's say for a moment, and I don't know if this is true or not, that that last, uh, get it in there, that last pin is the one that I need to pick to the absolute highest depth not going to happen. Not, not in this lock, not with this technology. So again, I believe it's probably physically impossible unless you're incredibly lucky. This 13,000, if I force it, it kind of will go past that angle, but then you can see the pick gets caught, it gets pinched, and I lose all feedback. So if I'm ever going to get into this one, Probably going to have to be just incredibly lucky. On top of that, and I haven't looked at this key, we're going to do it right now, and we're going to gut this thing to see what's inside of it. I can't get this one open, so we're stuck. Uh, this one, I would be willing to bet, is probably very similar to that. Probably violates all of the Mac rules. Let me find a knife here. Here we go. I'm going to go ahead and... This looks like rubber, but I think it's kind of glued on there. It's got something sticky on it. So I'm just going to... 
Yeah, I can already see. All right, so there's Dennis's uh, violation of the max, but again, it doesn't matter. It's a challenge lock. If it works, it's a valid challenge lock. And that's what I mean by getting hard, hard to get in there. Come on, don't tell me two of them don't work. There we go. So it does work. It's just because of the pins and the depths, it was just having a little trouble getting that last little bit. There we go. So it does work. Let's go ahead and gut it. I'm declaring defeat, and Dennis has whipped me yet again. All right, I'm going to need that. Let's go and take the tailpiece off. I think it's just frustrating when it's because of a physical limitation of your tools that you can't pick a lock. That's what I find most frustrating. I just can't imagine that I could get a, a thin enough pick. I've got some ten thousandths on uh, on order. They're coming to me. I'm not holding my breath. They're a pure experiment, but I, I think they're going to be way too thin. Something as thin as ten thousandth. I don't think you're going to be able to get enough feedback to make it worth your while. Okay, in addition to these crazy, crazy cuts, take a look at this. It looks like we have at least two pin in pins, number three and number five. But with Dennis, at, oh, we got more than that. Well, we got more than that. It looks like almost every one of them is going to be a pin in pin. All right, let's go ahead and see if we can get that key out. And not only that, it looks like Dennis has done some threading for us. So that's the way it goes. What's that saying? Sometimes you're the bug, sometimes you're the windshield. Today, I'm the bug. Okay, that one was not a pin and pin. I'm, I don't know how to describe these. That's why I'm not flapping my lips, because these are quite unusual. All right, every single one is threaded, all six. And grab some tweezers here and straighten these guys out. Almost all of these are pin and pin, for sure. Or plug-in pin, looks like. No, nope, that's just a, used to be a serrated, now it's been turned into a T-pin. All right, let's go ahead and completely gut it, and then we'll take a look at all the pins. All right, awesome serrations designed to catch those threads. All right, we have a serrated, looks like a serrated spool, handmade. The pins on the, or the springs on those two are both the same, it looks like. I'm just gonna leave them. They don't wanna come out. Number three, it is a spool interrupted only by serrations. And that was a key pin, but it was in there with the key with a point pointed upward. So we just modified a key pin. Oh, wow. And we got kind of the same thing here. Yep. Look at the workmanship on this. Just awesome. Uh, he was like that. I keep wanting to put the uh, pointy end down. All right, let's go back and start with number six back here. And we just, oh, I'm disappointed. It's all that is is a serrated one. My goodness, no multi-part pins. And number five looks like a ser another one of these serrated spools. All right, if you take a look at the, the springs, they're all right at the shear line except number five. He's the only one that's different. All the rest of them, right at the shear line. Um, I'm gonna dump these just to see if we've got any modifications upstairs. And I see nothing, all stock. No threads in the top, but with with the bidding that we had on this thing, I have this is about the craziest bidding I think I've ever seen. I don't feel bad not being able to open this thing at all. Um, let's take a look at these pins. These are just awesome. 
uh, all handmade multi-part pins here's a multi-part one here so if I can get them up come apart come on come on there we go this is a multi-part pin I wanted to say these were as well but they're just finely machined and those brakes I thought they were different pins but they're they're single single parters Anyway, fellas, there you go from Den Brass up in the frozen north, up in Canada. Anyway, fellas, thanks for your time. Stay safe. Stay legal. Dennis, don't bother sending me or any more logs, man. You have exceeded my abilities yet again. Thanks, guys.